So you're watching DevOps, the good, the bad, the ugly. My name is Zach Knord, and I am your host. Uh, this video cast series is really about all things related to DevOps, but we do place an emphasis on making sure security is a part of that equation. So today I'm, I'm excited to have Stephen McGill. Stephen, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Um, very, very excited to have you. So Stephen, to start out, I was hoping that maybe you could walk us through just a little bit about your background, especially I know you have a, a unique background in, in regards to static analysis. Uh, maybe you could share a little bit about where you went to school and how, how you got into it. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been a long and interesting road, you know, sort of getting here, um, you know, founding a company to build technology uh, focused on developers, developer productivity and security, and then and then getting that product out into the marketplace and now, you know, finding the Sonotype and bringing our product and technology together with theirs. Um, it, and it's it's been an interesting road because it sort of started on the research side of things. I did my PhD uh, in computer science at Carnegie Mellon um, in the static analysis space, but very okay. much you know the research side of that. And so uh, developing new techniques, uh, creating new tools to analyze software uh, for security purposes, resource usage, performance, all of all of that sort of thing. I, I worked on over the years, um, and then. It's really in, you know, more recently in the last 10 years or so, I've started getting uh, more interested in uh, the practice of software development, what's happening, you know, it, it, real organizations, you know, teams writing software every day, um, figuring out how best to use tools, what tools are even out there um, to benefit them and making sure that uh, we can bring uh, the advanced technology that's coming out of that research community um, that can have a huge impact um, at any enterprise. Um, but hasn't really been accessible up until now, you know, really making that easier to use, uh, making it uh, really simple to just make it a part of your workflow. And um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been exciting. It's been exciting, you know, uh, going down that path, seeing, uh, seeing the tools get broader usage and, and just talking to developers every day. You know, I think I learned so much um, from the users of, of the platform. Um, you know, that's definitely our focus is making sure we're providing value there. Yeah, that's great. And just to poke at that a little bit, because I think your 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 background in this is really interesting, uh, Stephen. So, where 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 did you do this research? Like where you said that you focus more on research, and can you walk through? Yeah. Like, did you speak with organizations? What what? Did yeah, that yeah. So initially, you know, at the university as part of my PhD work, then I did a postdoc at uh, another university, University of Maryland, um, where I continued my research activities, and then. Um, I spent some time uh, sort of doing research supporting government uh, programs. So um, things like DARPA, NASA, you know, organizations like that that are uh, really sponsoring cutting edge research, working together with uh, private industry, academia, government uh, teams uh, to develop new capabilities. Um, I led a lot of work of that sort um, at a company called Galois. Um, so Gawa is a 20 year old research and development company doing a lot of those government research services, uh, work and, um, you know, started, started various efforts there. Um, but also some commercial efforts, um, you know, so we did work with Amazon web services there, um, on, uh, actually formal verification of some of their technology. And there's, uh, there's some other talks and resources out there about, about that work. Um, but we were really focused on showing, you know, for certain core pieces of infrastructure, uh, like, for example, their um, uh, TLS stack, you know, so there's a, a library called S2N that's an open source uh, TLS stack out of AWS, you know, really showing that that does exactly what it's supposed to do. So achieving a very high level of security assurance around that. And, you know, that really is what first got me interested in, you know, these, these some of these advanced techniques really can be applicable, um, you know, to day-to-day -day software development um, if you can package them in the right way, integrate them in the right way. Um, present them to developers in a way that, you know, they don't have to have a PhD to apply the tools, right? But you can sort of bake some of that in so that sure. um, so that everyone can benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Now, and I've, I've, I've heard, you know, some of your talks at DevOps Enterprise Summit, for example, and, and, and obviously have looked through your research as you've come on board through, you know, at Sonotype now. Um, and, and really your philosophy from shifting from pipelines, scanning to source control management, providing um, collaboration at the um, at the pull request uh, where, where developers are naturally collaborating. Can you walk through why you see that as important? Maybe some of the research, the value um, that, that you yeah. have speaking with organizations. I know you even some of the articles I've read. You've talked about some, you know, what Facebook and Google are doing. But if you maybe you could share a little bit about that and your thoughts on why that. Yeah, important. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, 
there's, I think one of the central questions when, when you're adopting new tools and, and trying to uh, really improve your, your DevOps pipeline, your, your software development uh, process is, you know, how, how do you most effectively integrate these tools? And we've seen people take a lot of different approaches over the years, right? It used to be the standard was you have a nightly build and you run some tooling maybe alongside that. Um, and then you, you know, deal with those issues in the morning. Um, and, you know, that's been shown uh, sort of over the years to not be very effective. And, and Google in particular did um, published a, an article in communications with the ACM about all the things they tried, you know, what worked and what didn't. Um, and, you know, they found the overnight runs didn't work, the, the hackathons, the week long hackathons to address, you know, the bug backlog, you know, that was painful and, and didn't work. Um, and really, you know, getting tools integrated into software development is, is really the trick, right? And, um, you know, and they hit on code review as, as an important stage, really, you know, sort of the best stage if you're going to focus on one uh, to bring these tools in. And, you know, Facebook found the same thing. They have um, examples of tools that they incorporated that, uh, you know, people were basically ignoring the result. They were running overnight. Someone was triaging the results and reporting them as, as issues in the issue tracker, but they never got picked up and fixed, right? Took right. the same tool, integrated it into CI and saw the fix rate go up to 70%. So, you know, there's a huge impact you can get from integrating in the right way. Um, in terms of, you know, different places to integrate, like uh, CI versus uh, the pipeline, you know, or is, yeah, CI versus code review versus IDE, you know, those are sort of three common places to deploy tooling. Um, you know, I think code review offers some unique opportunities over the other two. So uh, as compared to running tools in the IDE, you can do a much deeper analysis in code review. You know, you have a little bit of time uh, to uh, look at the application as a whole and find things like uh, SQL injection attacks or threat safety issues or sort of complex resource leak type things, things that aren't really feasible to scan, um, you know, in real time in the IDE. Um, yeah. Compared to CI, uh, you can go broader in your sorts of issues that you flag, right? So if you incorporate a tool in CI, Generally, the way people use those is uh, they block the build, you know, if the tool, tool fails, right? Other, you kind of have to do that because otherwise people ignore it. You know, it's sort of under the covers, you know, happening in CI and it either succeeds or doesn't and nobody really goes uh, to look at the full results unless it fails, right? And so, uh, right. but then you have to be very careful about how you tune those tools because you don't want to be triggering, you know, build failures all the time on issues that, that developers decide don't need to be fixed. Oh, this, you know, this is a false positive. I, I don't actually need to address this. Um, and so you really have to tighten that rule set down to just sort of something very minimal. Whereas in code review, uh, you can report a broader range of issues. You can report those issues that, you know, you want to fix them 80% of the time, but, you know, sometimes it's appropriate in that context uh, because reporting in code review, the development team can have that discussion around, uh, you know, do we need to fix this in this instance? If so, how? Um, and so it, it really, it gives you a, a better opportunity to deploy a, a wider range of analyses. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's I'll probably to dive in a little bit more into that. Um, and, and some of the other interviews that I've had on here were, were yeah, speaking to some of the leaders that are trying to implement a little bit on the other side where you're trying to provide tooling um, to um, organizations that are trying to do it. Uh, now, false positives are, you know, no longer even a discussion. If you're providing false positives, developers will no longer look at it. Um, but there's this sense that I'm getting of over inundating or, or providing too much information to the developers and, and really how do we prioritize? And so you're kind of talking about tuning the tool. Is that, what, what do you mean by that? And, and so how do you attack that, that issue um, or address that issue of, of kind of providing too much information? What do you truly want the developers to focus on rather than uh, uh, all these things that they quite frankly aren't going to be able to look through? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. You know, when you're when you're delivering results directly to developers, um, you have to be very careful about what you report, right? Um, it needs to be something that um, is something that they'll decide should be fixed most of the time, you know, so that they don't start ignoring issues, deciding that this tool is producing too much noise. Um, it needs to be uh, actionable and understandable, you know, so um, uh, because, you know, it's as, it might as well be a false positive, right? Even if it's a real bug, but they can't understand why or how to fix it, you know, it might as well uh, be a false positive. And so, you know, we pay a lot of attention to what we call the fixed rate, which is when we report a bug in code review, what percentage of the time does a developer choose to fix that uh, before the code is merged? 
Okay. Um, and we really focus on having a high, high fixed rate, you know, really, again, taking a page from what Google and Facebook have done, you know, they have um, standards at, at Facebook, they target, you know, 70% fixed rate at Google for some of their tooling, you know, they want to hit 90% or they pull, pull the analysis and rework it. Um, and we take that same approach of really focusing on, on a high, very high fixed rate, um, which is, you know, in contrast to a lot of the industry where they're just sort of reporting everything, you know, there's a sense in some, with some static analysis tools, I think feel like the more you report, the better, right? You wanna you wanna have a really long list, right? Because you know you want someone to be able to count. Oh, you found two hundred issues. This other tool found a hundred. Um, but you know that that fails horribly at day to day usage, right? Because developers don't want to see ten results on every pull request, nine of which they ignore and one of which they fix, right? If that's your ratio, that's never gonna succeed. Um, and so you know we focus on just reporting sort of high confidence results, results that we know developers are fixing empirically. Um, and, you know, I think that what's interesting is that actually makes it a really nice complement to other security tools that might run later in the process, right? So the, the tools that are aimed at the security team, sort of the traditional SaaS tools, you know, still have their place because they're tuned to find everything that could possibly be an issue, right? And, and the security team is sort of signed on to yeah, when we're doing a full review of a software product before a major release, we're going to go through that list. And if 10% of them need to be fixed and 90% we need to triage out, like that's fine. That's our job. We, you know, we can do that quickly because we have the, you know, the background um, uh, to, to effectively manage that. And, uh, but you don't want to be reporting those same results to developers, right? So we report the ones that are actionable, the developers will fix. Code gets better, higher quality by the time it goes to some later review process. Um, and you know each of the tools have their place. So what I'm hearing, Stephen, is you're saying you know really kind of shifting to the mindset of we fix bugs elsewhere. Code quality, code security is the same thing. How do we provide that information on what developers actually care about? Um, and it almost sounds more like a, a crowdsourcing perspective of what does everybody else care about? You probably would care about this. So let's surface the things that that ultimately matter to you. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And we're working on surfacing more and more of that data in a more visible way so that you can see, you know, what are fix rates, you know, by bug category, by tool type, you know, how does that compare on your team versus others? Um, you know, because that, that data is super valuable to, uh, to really know uh, and gauge the impact of your code quality program, right? You know, you're deploying some new tool, you're making maybe some workflow changes, uh, you know, to, um, to prioritize code quality and try and improve that over time. Um, and so we want to be able to provide that data that shows you that it's being effective. No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And um, one other thought here to um, Stephen, just knowing a little bit about the architecture of, of what you built, maybe could you share a little bit um, a, a about, you know, obviously Muse is the um, product that you, uh, or, or, the, or the company that you were a CEO of, you built it out. Um, mm -hmm. what was it? I mean, obviously you've shared a little bit of the history of what you've been trying to do, but how did it come about and what, what does it actually look like? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Muse, uh, started as a spin out from Galois. So the company that I was doing research and development work at, um, you know, they have a program where, uh, if there's, if there's researchers there that, you know, have an idea that has market potential, you know, it would, could be a, could be a product. Um, they'll support, you know, spinning that out as a company. And so um, Muse was, I think, the fourth or fifth spin out that they supported in that way. Um, and then we, yeah, we sort of built it, incubated a bit in Galois, then built it sort of externally um, for a while and really focused, um, focused on a couple of things, focused on early engagement with enterprise customers to learn, you know, the needs on that and that part of the market, um, but also uh, sort of building it up first and foremost as a SaaS platform that's cloud native, easy to use, self sign up and so forth. And, you know, I think that dual focus helped us appreciate both um, the needs of, you know, really large enterprises with thousands of repositories, every possible language you could imagine, you know, just trying to, um, you know, implement even, uh, you know, even ba implementing basic security practices at that level of scale can be very challenging, right? Um, security and quality, like the scale becomes the issue. And so, uh, you know, learning how we can help um, address those needs, uh, combined with you know, then our our availability as a SaaS offering, um, let us uh, you know engage uh, very effectively with, uh, in particular, the open source community. You know, we we focused a lot on um, 
helping, you know, getting involved with um, places like Apache Foundation, Linux Foundation, you know, seeing what we can do to help uh, the community leverage these tools. Because, you know, I think one interesting thing about uh, Muse and now Lyft is, um, you know, the tools, the, the core tools are open source tools that are out there, you know, um, they're uh, in some cases, very advanced tools that are not easy to get up and running with, you know, and, um, and not easy to configure. And so, you know, we certainly provide that and we bring them all together. We have over 26 different tools now, you know, and so we make it easy to use this suite, but, you know, they're out there, they're open source tools, but they're, um, you know, they're sort of not used as widely as, as they might be. And so, you know, I think one thing I'm really excited about um, is the ability of, of this service because it's free for open source uh, to really increase the usage of these tools across the community, which, you know, I, I think creates a really great feedback loop where the tool authors now are getting more, uh, you know, more feedback from users. They have a larger user base. They can really, you know, do more to push those tools forward more quickly and everyone benefits. So what you know, kind of repeating back what I'm hearing, uh, Stephen, is you really ultimately built a platform that is, um, has the ease of use factor of taking these best of breed open source scanning solutions, low quality, and and maybe can provide you know even like Autoscar and and, and mm -hmm. different industries maybe can plug these things in, provide the ability to to easily run them to where you don't have to be a scientist like yourself to ultimately get them up and running, and then um, and and then be able to tune those to understand which ones of these. Um, issues developers ultimately care about is that accurate that's right that's right yeah those are those are sort of three key components of the, of the platform and um you know yeah there's there's a number of advantages to taking a platform approach and incorporating multiple tools um you know you get it's really the best way to get coverage across a variety of issue types and a variety of languages because different tools tend to have different focus areas they have their sweet spots you know they're, they're better at, at some issues than others and so combining tools really lets you get high quality coverage across you know a wide range of issue types um you know the other thing uh, about taking a platform approach is it's extensible so we've uh We've uh, defined an API where you can add your own tools. If you have third-party tools you're using, if you have internal tools that you've developed, uh, you can include them on the platform. Um, their results will get be re reported in, in pull requests. You'll get to see, you know, are they getting fixed or not? It goes through, you know, the data goes through all the same workflows as the core tools. In fact, we use those same APIs when we add tools to the platform, right? Um, and, you know, the other thing, you mentioned automation and making it easy to get up and running. Um, you know, that's super important for an individual trying the platform saying, you know, hey, I'm not using any static analysis tools right now. I wanna see what, what they provide, you know, let's try it out. Um, it's super important for large enterprises that are thinking about deploying this across hundreds or thousands of repositories, right? You sure. don't wanna to go to each of those and have to write a config file that says, you know, what languages you're using, what frameworks, you know, how to run it, the tool. Like if you have to do that times a thousand, that's a huge now uh, deployment cost. Which is with a lot of the current tools, from my understanding. That's right. Yeah, that's that's the default. That's that's the standard out there. And so we provide a lot of automation around that setup process, where you know most of the time with no configuration, you know we can get up and running on a repository and provide you know extremely high quality results for the mix of languages we find. So, just to put that into practical terms, right? As I think about that, say if we have a thousand repos, how long would it take to scan and GitHub? How long would it take to scan? Um, to get those onboarded? Yeah, so to get them onboarded, you know, it's like a couple of clicks. It's a few minutes to, you know, enable it. GitHub, um, when you add an app, uh, you can just say, run this on all repos, you know, and then from that point forward, any code changes, any pull requests that come into those repositories, they'll be scanned by the Lyft service. And so it really is, you know, that easy. Wow. And then if you want to go back and look at the existing issue list for these repositories, uh, you know, you can analyze those on a one-off basis on demand. Um, that will also populate as people add code to these repos. We're continually scanning and keeping track of that issue list. So it's always available, you know, if you want to go refer to it. Yeah, now this is amazing stuff that you're working on, Steve, and really, really appreciate the last question. Then I'm going to let you go with the, the remaining minutes that we have here is just um, on the good, the bad, the ugly. We talked about the good and then also the bad. Maybe is there like a failure or a challenge as you're going through all this research uh, that, that maybe helped you come to a conclusion or anything that you could share about a failure and what did you learn from it? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think um, one thing, um, you know, that, that is always a struggle is, is sort of like finding the balance between, so 
you know, it, what was new to me in all of this was really the, you know, managing an engineering team, man, you know, man, doing, doing sort of the, the process of producing, you know, user facing production software. Right. And so I think, uh, you know, everyone encounters a variety of challenges <laughs> with that process, you know, uh, doubly so when, you know, it's, uh, it's a startup and you're trying to be agile, but also, you know, have uh, good engineering and DevOps practices. Right. And so, you know, achieving the right balance there, uh, was definitely a, a learning process. You know, I think you know, figuring out, um, the right mix of, um, you know, getting, getting ahead, getting ahead of, uh, the engineering work, you know, not introducing tech debt, et cetera, while also being responsive and agile, you know, uh, to the you know very high extent that um, that you're is uh, possible and sort of expected in in a startup you know environment right it's 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 difficult to balance those two and so um, but you know I think I, I learned a lot about um, you know how architecture choices how how process and and just really how the team culture can help you know support both of those right it's always a balancing act it's always a challenge but um, you know I think with with the right tools in place you can make progress there. Yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate it. And, and just for those that don't know, uh, so basically Muse has been now converted into Lyft. I know you've came on um, from, you know, uh, from ultimately Muse Dev was acquired by Sonotype and Steven's now leading that team. And so it's been been interesting to watch. I know you just launched that that product officially. Um, yeah. So you're very busy. And so I appreciate your time here, Steven, and I'll uh, let you run and talk to you soon. Great. Thank you. Very nice to be here.